Good afternoon. Can everyone hear me clearly? I think this is what's known as the graveyard shift because I'm speaking after lunch, so everyone's probably sitting there feeling quite relaxed. I hope you all had a coffee. I'm 42, I'm married, I have two kids and no dog, and I'm excited. I'm very excited to be here today. Um, TED and TEDx are a fantastic platform and a very powerful platform, and it's an honor to be a small part of that. But as I stand here today, I'm also nervous and I'm anxious and I've got a nagging anxiety at the back of my head. Because imagine this, I'm giving this talk today in front of you, the audience, in front of these cameras, but imagine, might this talk be the high point of my success? I mean, is it possible that after today, this is as far as I've ever come and I never achieve much beyond today? I'll always have this TED talk today, but beyond today, no fame, no fortune, no impact. How can we know? How can any of us know what lies ahead of us? It's scary. And today's talk, the theme today is about expanding your horizons. And I'm going to talk a little, about, a little about what expanding horizons means to me and how that relates to my fear that maybe this is as far as I'm ever going to come. I'm going to roll forward. So I started in London and I was born in London and I grew up in London and I went to school and after that I was fortunate enough to go to university. And, <clears throat> excuse me, after university, I worked in London for five years and I worked in three different businesses in three different offices. And by the time I reached my 30th birthday, I was happy, I was okay, but I felt that I wanted to explore beyond what was already so familiar to me. So I went into my boss's office on the day after my 30th birthday and I resigned. I handed in my notice and I quit and I boarded a plane about a month later and I flew over to Asia and I came here to Shanghai and really this was to see what would happen. So here's me in 2003, a little bit thinner in the middle and a little bit thicker on top, but what can you do? Me bamfa. And um, when I came to China, I'd never been here before. I'd never been to China and I didn't know a single person here and I'd barely ever met anyone who'd ever even been to China. And I arrived with a bag on my back, literally a backpack, and my CV, my resume, was stored on what would now be called the cloud. Back then we called it a webmail server. <laughs> and it's funny to think it now, but in 2003, Shanghai and China was still quite cut off from the rest of the world. So this was five years before the Beijing Olympics. It was even a year before the Athens Olympics. And this was uh, only 18 months after 9-11. This was pre-smartphone, pre-Skype, and even when I went to buy one of those old Nokia mobile phones and a, um, a local SIM card, you still couldn't send SMSs internationally out of China to the rest of the world. It's hard to believe it now. And back then, there were fewer skyscrapers, as you can see, and there were more street scenes like this, and much of the city was like this. It was a building site and they were building this new city that we see around us today out of the ruins of the old one. And before I left London, my friend said to me, wow, you're so brave. You're so brave to be going away to China, to give up your job in England and all the rest of it. But honestly, I didn't feel brave at all. I felt lucky because this is what I wanted to do. Because when I was younger and I was growing up, I used to envy the kids who knew what they wanted to do because I never knew what I wanted to do. And my route to doing this was always to try to push boundaries and to break comfort zones and ultimately to um, explore what opportunities are out there. And I find this a very, very valuable thing. And when you throw yourself into the void, in my experience, you find things, things happen opportunities happen, you meet people, and you find the freedom to try new things and to do new things which you wouldn't have otherwise. So ultimately, when I look at back at what doing to Shanghai did to me 12 years ago, what happened is I was able to become closer to being the person that I wanted to be. So, the next thing I'm going to talk about is about throwing yourself into the void, because is it easy? Is it 
Easy or is it hard to throw yourself into the void into this great unknown? And for me, I've found that there are three requirements that have helped me take the chances to seek to go to new places and to see what I find there. And the first of these is curiosity. Now, people say that curiosity killed the cat, but I actually feel that curiosity makes the cat a whole lot wiser. It might kill it, but if it doesn't, it's wiser, stronger for it. And I feel that curiosity helps you find new worlds which you can explore and which you can learn from. And a hungry mind, an inquiring mind that's looking for new information and new experiences and new stimuli is surely one of the most healthy minds that's out there. And curiosity is the antidote to slowing down. Curiosity can be the impetus to drive people to do new things and to seek new goals. So curiosity is the first one. And the second is positivity. Now, to be honest, positivity is the one I struggle with the most. But we will spend a little time on it, a little bit of time on it. Positivity, it sounds unbelievably trite and cliched and frankly a bit lame to talk about positivity. Yeah, 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 positivity. But bear with me, if you think about it, positivity or hope or optimism or however you want to refer to it is the bedrock on which all ambition and all self-improvement is built. And it's a very powerful thing. So this caught my idea, caught my mind, I, uh, caught my eye, forgive me. This is an article about the Complaint Restraint Project, which is an organization which encourages people to sign up to spend a month doing no complaining. Now, if you think about that, it's impossible, yeah. I, I haven't tried it. I would imagine a day of no complaining is quite hard. Let's start with an hour. Can you imagine, okay? Interestingly, they chose February, the shortest month, um, but it's an interesting idea. And on the topic of positivity, these images are an art installation in London in 1966. And this is a famous work of art by Yoko Ono, who married John Lennon. And this is where John Lennon actually met Yoko Ono in her gallery. And he was, the Beat he was one of the Beatles in 1966. And she didn't know who he was. She'd never heard of him, bizarrely. And he'd never heard of her. He just heard there was this crazy Japanese artist chick having a gallery exhibition. So we went along. And he climbed up the stepladder, and as he looked through the magnifying glass, he could see up on the ceiling, written in tiny letters, was the word yes. And you can see in the interviews with him that when he talks about meeting his future wife, Yoko Ono, this day, her positivity that came through her work to him that day had a great big, huge effect on him. And really, positivity is about choice, because at any stage, we can choose whether our answer is yes or no, or maybe, or later. And therefore, choice is my third requirement. And I would argue it's the most important requirement, and I'm going to spend most time on it. I'd argue it's the most important requirement, because without choice, without the decision to actively go and do something, curiosity and positivity on their own aren't going to be amounting to much. So, Rion. Rion inspires with his story. And he is, when you meet him, um, uh, an agitated, uncomfortable-seeming, wiring, wiry person. But he has a hell of a story to tell, and he travels the road, travels the world to tell this story. And I saw him give a talk here in Shanghai three or four years ago. And Rion was born in a poor South African family. And when he was, he was a street kid at one stage, and when he was 16, he joined the military because it was a good opportunity, it was a good job, it paid well. And he grew up and he moved into the special forces. And in 1992, when he was 34, he was on a mission over the border and he was captured and he was sent to prison for 26 years in a Zimbabwean prison called Chikarubi. He was sentenced with being a spy. And Chikarubi is not a prison in the sense that we think of a prison. It's not somewhere you go to be punished and rehabilitated. This is a death camp where people are sent in order to die slowly and miserably. 
they have a 10% uh, failure, a 10% survival rate. Out of every 100 people who go in here, 10% make it out. Only 10 come out. And he talked with great detail about the conditions there. He was in a cell 24 hours a day, seven days a week. He was in a cell with 49 other people in a cell built for 12. And they had no open window and just a light bulb dangling that was open on all day, 24 hours a day. So they never knew what time of day it was or time of night. And when they lay down to sleep, half of them would lie down and half of them would have to sit against the wall with their knees against their chest and they'd have to take it in turns through the night. Now beyond this degradation was the hunger which was constant because they were given just one small meal a day. And the beating. The guards would go around every day the whole prison, and cell by cell, and they would beat all of the prisoners. It's a death camp. And Rion was in this prison for 12 years and eight months. Think about the mental strength you would need to survive that. But it's a positive message, and his message is that while you can't always choose your environment. You can't always choose your circumstances. You can always choose how you react to them. And he gave two examples. And the first of these was the hunger, which was constant. But after training himself over many, many months, he, as he describes it, was able to reprogram his brain. He chose to no longer feel hungry again, and the hunger went. And next he focused on the beatings. And every day when the guards would come round the prison, he would sit for two hours hearing the cries and hearing the beatings and fear, fearing of what was to come and sweating. And he decided that he was not going to let this get on top of him. He was going to beat these circumstances. And he worked on it and he worked on it. In the end, he chose to no longer be scared. After all, they were going to beat him anyway. Why be scared? And he succeeded in no longer being scared. And a few months after that, one day they came in and they didn't beat him. They beat everyone else, but they didn't beat him. And he thought, what's going on? It must be Christmas. They forgot me. They never, caught, never forget me. And the next day they didn't beat him either, or the next day. And this is the power of choice. So we have curiosity and positivity and choice. And each of these really are all that we have in the face of this fear that we have that maybe from here we never amount to much, and that all the future we may never achieve more than we have already in the past. But these are what keep us going, and these are what help us to make a leap of faith, even though we're jumping into the unknown. And so my story finishes here, and I read these books a year, year and a half ago, and they greatly inspired me. They referred to a back-of-envelope calculation that if everybody in the wealthy 22 nations, the OECD, 22 nations of the world, was to donate 0.62% of their income, that's less than 1% of their income, to good causes, to the right causes, then this would be enough to raise everybody in the world below the poverty line up to the poverty line. 0.62, it's such a small amount. You'd think that would be 10% or 20%, but this indicates how much over here there is that it can make such a difference over here. And this 0.62 stayed with me, and it inspired me. And I decided to try to spread this idea. And I went and bought 0.62.org. And one of the things I'm going to be setting up this year is a non-profit with the objective of increasing the amount of donations that are given globally. Now, it's one thing to spread an idea and raise awareness, and it's another thing to actually get people to change their behavior. So we'll see how we'll go, and time is going to tell. But that's my story. I want you guys to have a think. What is it that you guys are curious about? What is it that you guys feel positive about? What is it that you guys are going to choose to do to make your impact beyond today bigger than so far to this point? Thank you. <laughs>